All right. So at the beginning of chapter four, I was talking about bridges, bridges between arrays and tables. And uh, this is exactly the topic of this particular video. Uh, the following two slides or the following three slides, I guess, they may not look particularly um, um, important, but I think they are the core of the discussion of uh, arrays inside PostgreSQL. Uh, the, the upcoming material is really the central stuff. So array literals, constructing and index in arrays and so on. I think that's uh, that's really business as usual. But uh, what's being discussed now is really the core of the matter, the ability to marry relational operations and array operations in a well-defined and I think quite elegant fashion. Okay. And to do that, to really perform that marriage, we need bridges that bring us from the array world into the tabular world and back. And uh, this is actually very simply done in SQL. And uh, it's so simple that both bridges in both directions fit on this single particular slide. We will improve on that on the upcoming slide. But first, let's see what, what's going on here. So let's first try to go from the world of arrays. So from this particular array, maybe the XS array of n elements, let's go from the array world into the tabular world, okay? And uh, representing the same information that's being stored inside this array, these n elements, I think in a tabular fashion, it should look like this. Uh, this would be a table of all the n elements. So all of the n elements are found in this table now. That would be our tabular representation, and that would be a bridge from the array world to the tabular world. And as you can see, this is performed by a built-in function called unnest. Unnest the array contents and then iterate over the re result of this unnest function. You see that we are using this unnest function in a place in the select query here in which we would normally expect a table. Okay, so what we are seeing here, what's highlighted now, is actually being used in place of a table that should be a set or a bag of values or of rows actually and uh, so it's clear that unnest must deliver just that unnest must deliver a set of things over which sql the sql from clause then can iterate all right and that's what we're doing here we are iterate we are iterating over the rows returned by this unnest function they have a single field these rows we call that field alum and that alum field will contain all these xi's and once we are here we can do anything in a, the sql world as you can see we are just outputting the uh, the captured elements here and that's how we got this particular table but we could do all kinds of things once we get hold of these t dot lm elements of the array okay so unless the array contents return a set of things that we can iterate over using our regular sql constructs and then uh, do whatever we like with all the array elements for example collect them in a table this is the bridge from arrays to tables and um, as you can see, as we've already discussed, unnest is a particular function. Function is a, it's a set returning function. That's why we can iterate it uh, uh, over the results returned by, by unnest. And that's why we can use it in place of a regular table. Such functions are called set returning functions. And they are particularly interesting because they can assume the role of tables. We will discuss these uh, in the upcoming videos really soon. Okay, so what about the other bridge? How about going from the tabular world into the array world? All right, this would be the second query on this slide. And this would be a representation of data in the tabular world. It's a particular simple table. It's a literal table that I've specified that I've embedded in this, is this query. It has n rows of a single uh, field only, a single field only, and this field in these n rows carries the values x1 to xn. Okay, I can of course iterate over these rows, call them t, call that single uh, 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 um, uh, field lm, all right, so business as usual un until now. And what I want to do is I want to collect, I want to collect all of these n 
element values into a single value, into a single array that contains all the n x i. And uh, condensing a number of rows into a single value is the task of aggregate operations in SQL. All right. We have seen aggregates like sum and max and count. Now we see the array aggregate operation. The array aggregate operation receives a group, a number of values. In this case, the t dot lm, the element values that we are supposed to place inside the array. And from these, it will construct a single value, a single array aggregate value. We call that xs and then arrive here in this uh, single row, single column table, which carries just this one array. And as you know, in SQL, such a single row, single column table is just as good as the value contained in the single cell, which is just the array. So we indeed went from the tabular world over into the array world using the aggregate operation array ag. So unnest and array ag, these together build a very powerful pair to go from the array world to the tab tabular world and then maybe go back from the tabular world back to the array world. We can come back to this. There's one thing that should make you feel uh, uneasy, I think, and that's the notion of order, which is so important for these array values, but which has completely been lost when we go over to the tabular world. As you know, this is a regular table. It's not special only because it's been constructed by unnest or something. There is no well-defined order on the rows of this table. The array element order information has been lost. Okay, to fix that, let's consider the same slide again with a slight twist. Okay, so this is actually the same story as on the previous slide, but now it's uh, the order preserving story of the same thing. Let's first go from the airy world over to a tabular world. Okay. And you see that this is an improved tabular representation of the array. All of the elements are there, but their index position, their original index positions inside uh, the array has been explicitly encoded in this table in the index column. We could now easily jumble and resort and shuffle all the rows in this two column table. We would always be in the position to tell the original indices of the xi in the original array. Okay, so the unnest function delivers the first column of information, all the array elements. It's modifier with ordinality, with ordinality. This is the modifier I'm talking about. This modifier uh, instructs the set returning function to not only return its uh, regular result, the elements, but also the position at which this particular element would occur in the result. Okay, so what we then get is a two column row or two fields row. The first field would con contain the regular uh, element information. The second field would be contributed by the with ordinality annotation and it would reflect the original position in the array. Okay, so this would be a complete representation of the array semantics with all the element contents and the crucial position information. Okay, so let's now try to get back from such a complete representation of an array in tabular form back to the regular uh, array form. Okay. So our starting point would be this now. This would be the tabular representation with the explicit encoding of the array positions, of the positions of the elements x, i. Okay, if we iterate over this embedded table, this literal table, then we would uh, see, of course, two column rows, two column rows t with fields lm and index. Okay. Again, we will use the array ag operation. We would use the array operation to uh, aggregate these n rows into a single array value. And the elements of the array, uh, uh, of the constructed array would still be the elements, the xi. 
but the order in which they are placed inside this array would be specified explicitly by this order by modifier. We have seen that before in the ordered aggregate functions. This is actually nothing new really, but we are using it to good effect here. Okay, so this element would be placed at this particular index. The indexes describe the order of the elements inside the array. This is all we need to construct a properly ordered array. And the order of all the xi here in the constructed array is no coincidence. It's very well defined. It really reflects the explicit index information that we have left here in this column. All right. So this with ordinality modifier really is the key here. And it's not particular or particularly special for the unless set returning function. There are other set returning functions. We will meet many of them. We will even construct our own versions of these. And all of these set returning functions f could be annotated with this with ordinality modifier. This will add a trailing column to the result of uh, the function f itself and it will uh, attach these ascending indices 1, 2 and so on to the original output of function f. All right, so that's the entire bridge story. It's the unnest with ordinality and the array egg using the order by modifier story. And I think that's uh, the, the quite elegant outcome. All of this actually suggests something. It suggests a general pattern of array processing inside a SQL-based system. So I'm, I'm talking about this uh, relational array programming pattern. And if there is one slide among the slides uh, uh, about uh, of the array discussion that we've just uh, seen in the last three videos. If there is one particular slide, I would need to pick and bring it with me on a lonely island. You're only allowed to bring one slide. This would be the slide I would bring. This captures very the very important the crooks the gist of what we have just discussed the the marriage of tabular and array uh, values and operations on these. So this unnest and order array egg and, and the and the ordered array egg they suggest a, a particular programming pattern with arrays in a relational system. So if we want to process arrays in a very general fashion in such a SQL or relational based system, we would of course start out with some input array. You see I've just uh, indicated three elements with these little squares here. So there are some array operations provided inside uh, SQL, but they are limited and uh, we would of course like to build our operations on the rich set of construct that is provided by SQL. Uh, and these operations are, they are numerous and they are very well optimized. So we would rather talk in terms of relational vocabulary about these arrays. And that's what we can do once we apply unnest with ordinality to this particular array. What we would end up with is a table, a two column table in which we of course find all the square array elements. Uh, enriched with this explicitly encoded position information. This is a regular table. We could apply the full force, the full power of SQL now, operate over this table, do some filtering, joining, rearrangement, aggregation, um, recursive operations, as you will see. We can do all of cool stuff with this particular table, and we would end up with a different table. Maybe the array elements have changed, changed their shape from, uh, from uh, square to triangle, whatever that means. And maybe even we have jumbled the order. All of this is possible. Once we are done with our array transforming array computation job, it would then be time for array egg order by, which would of course, the order by would, would of course uh, 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 honor this explicitly encoding new position information to construct a new three element array of triangles ordered in a particular fashion as indicated by the second column. Okay, so we would go from array to array. We would pass the relational world, use the full power of SQL in this particular uh, step, and would end up with a quite powerful and very scalable array processing system. This would one particular interesting, one possible pattern of array programming inside, inside the SQL. So 
be aware that the steps one and three, of course, add some overhead to the OS story. So an RDMS is not is not an array of vector programming language, just like APL might be. Uh, it's not, but uh, this still is a very interesting way to think about array operations, and we will see variations of that uh, in many in many of the of the more complex use cases that we will consider in the remaining lecture. Okay, so to get a taste of this, let's switch over to the editor and look at uh, how this might uh, perform in the real system. So here's my uh, SQL buffer again. Let's open up the SQL console. There it is. Uh, let's first um, do the bridge walking. Let's walk the bridge from the array world, this is the area we are considering, to the tab tabular world. And let's use the uh, uh, version of Unest with ordinality that does not forget ordering information. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, there we go. Uh, all of the elements are here and they are of course paired with their corresponding indexes. This is no coincidence. Uh, at index 3, we will find value, this textual value x3 here, and that's how it should be. All right. So then let's walk the bridge back. Let's walk the bridge back to the world of tables, of arrays. I'm sorry about that. So this is the tabular representation of the array, and uh, it would have three elements that are positioned at these indexes, which are, which are uh, explicitly encoded. You would iterate over these two field rows, over, the, over these two column rows, and then aggregate these to get to obtain a single array value again. All right. And of course, we would uh, inform the aggregate that order of error elements is not arbitrary, but it should reflect the original indexing information. And that's what we are doing here. And that's how we end up with x1 to x3 here. Of course, now that we are free to define the order in which the array elements are being aggregated, we could do all kinds of crazy stuff here. The comment already suggests that we could replace the default sort order by this descending sort order and thus reverse the array and uh, end up with a reverse array here. All kinds of uh, index computations could find their place here and determine the final element order inside the constructed array. Okay, so that would be the basic bridge walking array to tables, tables to arrays. Okay, there's one thing I haven't told you about the unless function. It's actually more powerful than it seems. Uh, we have seen the unnest function to uh, proce that processes a single array. An uh, array is being unnested and all its elements are exposed as individual rows over which we can iterate. Actually, the unnest function can consume more than one array at once. Okay, you see that I'm uh, that I'm uh, calling unnest over the parents and the labels arrays of the tree T here. I'm I'm iterating over all our trees T and I'm considering their parents and their labels arrays inside a single unnest call. Unnest will do its job and consider the elements in these particular arrays and will convert them into rows over which we can iterate. And the first elements in both arrays will form one row. The second elements in both arrays will form the next row and so on. So corresponding elements, the first the second, the third elements are the same indices, they will be used to form wider rows. And as you can see, two arrays here in the unless call lead to rows of two fields that we can iterate over. Okay. This brings the parents and the labels information of the nodes in our trees together. This is really uh, convenient. So let's do that, and uh, to keep the output short, let's uh, restrict the output to only those nodes that belong to the tree 2. Okay, so we have extracted parent and label information formerly stored in arrays, now stored in tabular form. So label D in tree 2 has parent 4, and label E has the same parent. Okay, so that parent 4 indeed has, yeah, 
has two children, the E and D children. Okay, uh, so uh, what 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 node index does this particular uh, this particular uh, uh, what label does this parent four have? I cannot look that up because I currently cannot see the real node indexes, the node numbers here in this output. But I could easily augment that and have that output explicitly if I just used the ordinality modifier, as we've already discussed. Okay, so unless itself will yield a two-column output, will contribute the parent and label columns, and the ordinality will append, will contribute yet another column, the indexing column that we've talked about already, and that's what we see here. So the unnest over two arrays with ordinality will deliver three column rows. All right, and if we then uh, uh, if we then uh, look at the output, then we can finally see. Okay, so this would be the complete tabular encoding of the uh, tree two that we've uh, that we've uh, already seen in the previous lectures. So seven nodes. These are the node numbers. And we now we can see that uh, the E and D nodes both have parent of number four. Number four is indeed the B node. Okay, so the B node is the parent of D and E. Now we can see that this is the complete unnesting of the formerly array-based information about the tree encoding. All right. So uh, once we arrive at this complete tree encoding of the trees that we are operating over. Uh, once we arrive at that, we can uh, use the power of SQL to operate over this tree based or this table based encoding of trees. We could uh, look for particular labels, uh, we could select nodes with a particular parent and so on. All of these would be simple selection operations over this table. We could also come back to one of our problems that we have considered in the last video and uh, where we said, oh, it would be nice, it would be nice if we could specify operations that visit all the labels in a tree, visit all the labels in a tree, and then transform all of these labels to uppercase. We need some way to iterate over the elements and to perform the uppercase operations over the labels. And with the bridges, the unnest bridge uh, from labels, from arrays, I'm sorry, to tables, that's all we need. All we need to do is just that. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's iterate over all the trees and consider their parents and labels arrays in sync. Okay. And together with ordinality information. So we would really end up with a tabular view of the array encoding as we've seen below here. Okay. And then uh, we would consider each of these trees, each of these trees on their own. We would not mix the nodes between two trees, so we grew, would group by the tree identifier here. Okay, so the nodes of tree 1, the nodes of tree 2, the nodes of tree, t, tree 3, they would be considered separately, where they would be in different groups here. And inside each of these groups, inside each tree, we would just reconstruct the original parent array information. If we want to uppercase all the labels, we don't need to modify the parent information of all these nodes. So what we are going to do is construct a new parents array for the for the new uppercase label trees. But this new parents array would be would have just the contents of the old parents uh, array. Okay, so uh, it would just carry the original parent information in the original node index order. It's a bit different for the labels, so we would construct a new labels array using the array uh, operation, and of course the array, uh, the labels would be ordered just like before, but the labels would undergo this uppercasing operation, uh, which, which is just what we wanted. Each of the nodes is being iterated over, each of the nodes is being considered uh, separately in this uppercase operation, and uh, that's all we needed. The uppercase nodes are being aggregated to form a new labels array. So everything as before, parent information, parent information has not changed. Um, and there we go. The new labels are all in uppercase. Glorious. Okay. So we had. Uh, 
post ourselves more tree problems. For example, the problem of finding all finding the parents of all nodes labeled C. Now that we have the unnest uh, bridge from arrays to uh, two tables and our ability to then select and uh, uh, iterate over the rows of the generated tables at will with our SQL constructs, uh, now that's a very easy thing to do. Okay, so let's see. We would iterate over all the trees. Inside all the trees, we would, would like to identify, to identify the special parents, the special parents of the C nodes. Okay, so iterate over all the trees. Inside each tree, consider all the labels. Okay, so unpack all the labels. Now the labels are really available to us as individual rows over which we can iterate. So each of each of these trees is now paired with all of the labels of its nodes. Recall that this is just the ordinary, this comma is just the ordinary Cartesian product. Each tree is now paired with all the labels um, that it contains. So we are only interested in the C labels at this particular point. Everything else is being removed here. All right. Okay. Um, well, and uh, now that we know which node corresponds uh, to the C labels, we of course also know the index of the C labeled nodes. We would just use that index and look their parent nodes up in the T parents array. Uh, because the labels and the parents array are in sync, we can use the same index here. We would just use the T parents square brackets node index operation to look up the parents of the C nodes. And that's what we try to do. Okay, so there are C nodes in all of these three trees, it appears. And uh, these are the parents of the C nodes. So let's see. So in the first tree, there is indeed a C node and it has a parent A and that parent is the node with index one and that's true. All right, so let's check for the second uh, tree. Um, in the second tree also has a C node. There it is. It has a parent if the parent is labeled G and that is the node at index six. So looks good to me. Uh, it appeared to work. So the unnest bridge allowed us to uh, also perform this second operation, the second problem that we posed ourselves. And there was uh, also the problem of uh, how to identify the forest among the trees. We have already seen uh, one version of that operation in the last video, but we could also do the same thing with the unnest bridge from arrays to tables. Okay. So again, we would like to identify which of the trees T are indeed forests, have more than one root node. Okay, so we would iterate over all the trees and then consider their parents array, the parents array, and would unnest that, unfold that, so that we can access the parent information in a row on, a, on their own um, for each of the parent elements. Okay, so let's... Uh, well, why not uh, perform this query only partially to see how the intermediate results look like? So let's first look at the select from clause only. I can send this over to PostgreSQL and add a semicolon here. Okay, so let's see what we have. So all of the three trees are being considered. And uh, for all of the three trees, there parent information has been unfolded. Okay, you see the parent information here. Um, and because we also, because we, uh, because we also, uh, because we uh, output the T star here, uh, we see each of these trees multiple times, each time for each of the parents that we could find inside these trees. So there is uh, six parents recorded for the tree one, so we see six copies of the tree one row here in this output. Okay. Okay. So this would be the uh, the input tabular information that we are now operating over inside our SQL query. Okay. So maybe this becomes clearer if I also output the node here.
yeah, maybe that's clear now. The, the node and the, the node parent information. So you see that each in each of these trees, in each of these trees, uh, we find that tree now paired with all the unnested parent information that uh, is provided by the parents array. And I think this may be uh, the clearer representation of the intermediate result here. Okay, so that's what we are operating over. Okay. So this is a lot of information. We are not interested in all of these. Actually, we are interested in those nodes that have a null parent because these are the root nodes. These are the root nodes. Okay, so you see that there is indeed some null parent information in each of the trees. So 3.1 has one node with a null parent and 3.2 has one node with a null parent and 3.3 even has two nodes with a null parent here. Oh, that's interesting. All right. So uh, uh, let's do that. Let's also add the predicate to our intermediate result. Okay, can do that. Okay, so indeed, in tree one, one root node, in tree two, two root nodes, in Three, three, two root nodes. So oh, this looks like a forest to me. Oh, it's very easy to spot. If we would just consider and group by the tree column here, we would find two elements, two root nodes in the group for tree three and only one element in the group for trees one and two. That's easy to do. Just group by the tree and see how many elements you'll find in that particular group. And if that is larger than one, we have found our forest. So, yes, indeed, this is the forest. Fine, we have identified it. Perfect. Okay, so again, uh, the unnesting has been the key here, the possibility to look at the array elements of the two parents array in, uh, individually is as individual rows over which we can then iterate or using a regular SQL query. This is the bridge from arrays to SQL. So if you recall, there has been also been a, a problem too that we have posed ourselves. This was a tree restructuring problem. So attach one tree, the root of one tree to the leaf of another tree, glue them together. And we were briefly considering that this would involve some array gluing and some renumbering and so on. And uh, we have everything at hand now with the unnest and array egg and all the other array operations that we've discussed in the two previous videos. Everything is on the table now. Everything is available that we would need to express this operation. And as you can see, I've done that here. I've done that here. Uh, so I've taken two trees, identified two trees, T1 and T2. I want to glue these together. This is the particular leaf I'm identifying in T1 to which T2 should be glued. All right. Uh, so let's define these, that's fine. And then comes the query. And you see it's already been introduced by width. That's an indicator that the re remaining query is a bit larger. I've sliced it into different chunks, which do uh, parts of the job each. So uh, here's some stuff and then some stuff more and then more stuff even. And you see that there is some gluing going on. Indeed, we are gluing labels. And we're also gluing parent information here, but uh, we have to process the parent information. We have to do some shifting here and so on. All of this is quite complex and quite awkward. This is a testament to two things. SQL is not an array programming language. It can deal with array-based or array-valued cells quite elegantly, but it has never been constructed and never been meant to be a replacement for an array processing language. And, uh, well, the result is some really complex and somewhat awkward code here. Also, the encoding of trees that we've selected, this array-based encoding of trees, is one possible encoding. It's by far not the best tree-based encoding that you could choose in a relational database system. I think during the course of this, uh, uh, of this advanced SQL instance, we will come across better tree encodings. And uh, both of these, uh, both of these facts, like uh, SQL, can talk about arrays, but it is not a native array programming language. And this somewhat 
awkward encoding of trees inside arrays. Both of these contribute to the fact that this query is way more, is way larger and probably less elegant than we would hope. It does the job. This is the glue tree. You see that all the labels have been uh, glued together. And there's also some shifted parents information here. There is a single root, looks good to me. But uh, this is somewhat awkward. I have to admit that. Uh, but still, we will see very valid and very elegant uh, uh, occurrences of arrays in complex queries. Still, SQL remains a table-focused language. And uh, this becomes even more apparent when we consider other problems, a new problem three that I'm posing here, like, uh, hey, which are the nodes on the path from a node labeled F to the root? Let's just walk upwards towards the root from some given node F. So let's walk from F to its parent. And if that's not the root, then walk, walk from that node to its parent. And if that's not the root, then walk from that node to its parent. Walk upwards, walk upwards, walk upwards until we hit the root node. How many steps do we have to take? How deep was that particular node F located? We don't know. The number of steps that we have to take would be unknown when we start this particular computation. And uh, this is something that we cannot easily avoid, we cannot actually express given the operations that we have available uh, until now. We would need to repeatedly peek in the parents array until the stop condition, namely we found the root condition has been fulfilled and this iterate, iterate a particular computation until some condition has been uh, has been satisfied is something that we cannot express in its very general fashion with the constructs in SQL just yet. But we will come to this. Something still missing, a very great idea to be added to the SQL language is still going to come in chapter six, I guess. Uh, we will do that. We will do just that. And I'm looking forward to discuss this with you. Okay. Until then, this is the area support we've got and it's still quite powerful, I would say. Okay, so arrays and tables live heavily together. Nice. We will make use of that in the upcoming uh, course. And uh, I would be happy if I can see you there. Bye-bye.